And here we go. This is Flash at in a perfect world tonight on the 24th of March, 2020. So far, so good, I suppose. And uh like to do my usual hellos and, and thanks to Grim for all the help he's been so I could do all this crazy radio shit over the time I've been doing it. And uh tonight, if you're in the chat room for your chatting entertainment, we have bar. These are the bots and bodies. And I separated them because when I was new to all this, I didn't know that some of these were bots. I didn't even know what bots could do, and they're pretty fun. So hmm. we credit them in the loads. And we've got Barman, Beetle, Cowboy, Tech, Grimnir, Moose Girl, Kate, Anti, Asmo, Brent underscore, hey Woody, Chouse, Doomy Circle, oh, hello, honey, Don, Damn Van Meter, Duh, Free Enslaved, Graham Z, Java, Doctor, Two, Meister Brow, Prince Rob Works, Rome's Trust, Number One, Vanna White, Woodman, Phantom, Bruce Dickinson, Chaskara, Cyborg Noodle, and E-Man, Ensiv, Me, Frumpy, Frumpy Work, Gromit, Jays, Nines, Jays, Kiss, Pone Sauce, Sock Puppet, Smodaz, The Holiest Roger, and Zupix. And I figured that everybody's due for a little break. So if, you know, if you do listen to the in a perfect world podcast. I have the coronavirus night off for your listening enjoyment <clears throat> on real liberty media <laughs> And what I decided to do is I, I I've been following the news <laughs> and <laughs> such over the uh period of time that I'm not gonna bring up on the radio tonight. And it brought to mind a book. And I'm going to say that much about the book that I'm going to use for the show this evening. But I'm not going to tell you what the title is until it's over. But I expect out of the group, Grimm will probably figure out what book it is just by the text of the book. So, here we go. Chapter 1. It was a bright cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it, a colored poster, too large for indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply a, an enormous face, more than a meter wide, the face of a man of about 45, with a heavy black mustache and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift. Even at the best of times, it was seldom working. And at present, the electric current was cut off during daylight hours. It was part of the economy drive in preparation for hate week. The flat was seven flights up, and Winston, who was 39 and had a varicose ulcer above his right ankle, went slowly, resting several times on the way. On each landing opposite the left, the lift shaft, the poster with the enormous face gazed from the wall. It was one of those pictures which are so contrived that the eyes follow you about when you move. Big Brother is watching you caption beneath it ran. Ah! Inside the flat, a fruity voice was reading out a list of figures. 
Records, which had something to do with the production of pig iron. The voice came from an oblong metal plaque, like a dulled mirror which formed part of the surface of the right-hand wall. Winston turned a switch and the voice sank somewhat. Though the words were still distinguishable, the instrument, the telescreen it was called, could be dimmed, but there was no way of shutting it off completely. He moved over to the window, a smallish, frail figure, the meagerness of his body merely emphasized by the blue overalls which were the uniform of the party. His hair was very fair, his face naturally sanguine, his skin roughened by coarse soap and blunt razor blades, <laughs> and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Outside, even through the shut window pane, the world looked cold. Down in the street, little eddies of wind were whirling dust and torn paper into spirals. And though the sun was shining and the sky a harsh blue, there seemed to be no color in anything, <laughs> except the posters that were plastered everywhere. The black, mustachioed face gazed down from every commanding corner. There was one on the house front immediately opposite. Big Brother is watching you, the captain said, while the dark eyes looked deep into Winston's own. Down at the street level, another poster, torn at one corner, flapped fitfully in the wind, alternately covering and uncovering the single word I-N-G-S-O-C. In the far distance, a helicopter skimmed down between the roofs hovered for an instant like a blue bottle, and darted away again with a curving flight. It was the police patrol snooping into people's windows. Hmm. The patrols did not matter. However, only the thought police mattered. Ah, ah, ah. Is this good or what? Behind Winston's back, a voice from the telescreen was still babbling away about big iron. Pig. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Smoking here. Pig iron and the over fulfillment of the ninth, ninth three year plan. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. Any sound that Winston made above the level of a very low whisper would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision, which the metal plaque commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. There was, of course, no way of knowing whether you were being watched at any given moment, how often or on what system. The thought police unplugged in. Wait, the thought police plugged <laughs> in on any individual wire was guesswork. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. But at any rate, they could plug in your wire whenever they wanted to. You had to live, did live, from habit that became instinct, in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard and, except in darkness, every movement scrutinized. Winston kept his back turned to the telescreen. It was safer, though as we, as he well knew, even a bat can be revealing. A kilometer away, the Ministry of Truth, his place of work, towered vast and wide above the grimy landscape. This, he thought, with a sort of faith, dist distaste, this <laughs> was London. <sighs> Chief City of Airstrip 1 itself the third most populous of the province of Oce Oceania. <laughs> I like it when they make up words, and then I struggle with them. That's always fun. He tried the third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. He tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that could tell him whether London had always been quite like this. Were there always these... Vistas of rotting 19th century houses, their sides shored up with box of timber. 
their windows patched with cardboard and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions, and the bomb sites where the plaster dust swirled in the air, and the willow herb straggled over the heaps of rubble, and the places where the bombs had cleared a larger parch, a larger patch, and there had sprung up sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. But it was no use he could not remember. Nothing remained of his childhood except a series of bright lit tableau occurring against no background and mostly unintelligible. And he writes in a really good way that I'm not really prepared to read, but it's, it's a good story. The Ministry of Truth. Many true in Newspeak. Newspeak was the official language of Oceania for an account of its structure and etymology. See appendix. <laughs> Hold on, let me get a drink here. Whoop. Let me get a hit here instead. Mm-hmm. Where was I now? Oh, that. They put in some bracket work here. It threw me off. Anyway. It was an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete soaring up terrace after terrace, 300 meters into the air. From where Winston stood, it was just possible to read. (laughs) Picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The Ministry of Truth contained, it was said, 3,000 rooms above ground level, and corresponding ramifications below. Scattered about London, there were just three other buildings of similar appearance and size. So completely did they dwarf the surrounding architecture that from the roof of Victory Mansions, You could see all four of them simultaneously. They were the homes of the four ministries between which the entire apparatus of government was divided. The Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, (laughs) entertainment, education, and the fine arts. The Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war, the Ministry of Love, which maintained law and order, and the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. Their names in Newspeak. Many True, Many Packs, Many Love, Many Plenty. <laughs> the Ministry of Love was the really was the really frightening one. <laughs> there were no windows in it at all. Winston had never been inside the Ministry of Love, nor within half of a a kilometer of it. It was a place impossible to enter except on official business, and then only by penetrating through a maze of barbed wire entanglements, steel doors, and hidden machine gun nests. Even the streets leading up to its outer barriers were roamed by gorilla-faced guards, in black uniforms, armed with jointed truncheons. Those stabber things at the end of your gun, right? (laughs) Gun lovers out there, because I I love the gun lovers. I just don't think much is going to really come of any of that. Anyway, meanwhile, back in the book. Ah, And you figured out the book. I'm sure you did. Ah, there you go. I just saw saw it on the Arlen screen, because... It's hard for me to, to pay attention to two different screens, so I'm not that damn good. So I'll take a moment and wet my whistle here and continue with this, this epic. Well, now we all know what it is. George Orwell's 1984. I just thought it was so appropriate considering the situation that we're all in. You know, different levels of it right now. So I'm stalling while I put my cigarette out and get a little sip. And then we'll go back to 1984. <clears throat> Let's see what was that. Oh. Uh, Winston turned round abruptly. 
He had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism, which it was advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. He crossed the room into the tiny kitchen. By leaving the ministry at this time of day, he had sacrificed his lunch in the canteen. And he was aware that there was no food in the kitchen except a hunk of dark colored bread, which he, which had got to be saved for tomorrow's breakfast. Boy, that's living short. He took, he took down from the shelf a bottle of colorless liquid with a plain white label marked Victory Gin. <laughs> it gave off a sickly, oily smell as of Chinese rice spirit. Hmm, I wonder if that's like sake. Winston poured out nearly a teacup full, nerved himself for a shock, and gulped it down like a dose of medicine. <laughs> Instantly, his face turned scarlet and the water ran out of his eyes. The stuff was like nitric acid, and moreover, in swallowing it, one had the sensation of being hit on the back of the head with a rubber club. <laughs> oh, man. The next moment, however, the burning in his belly died down and the world began to look more cheerful. He took a cigarette from a crumpled packet marked Victory Cigarettes and incautiously held it upright, whereupon the tobacco fell out onto the floor. <laughs> with, <laughs> with the next, he was more successful. He went back to the living room and sat down at a small table that stood to the left of the telescreen. From the table drawer, he took out a pen holder, bottle of ink, and a thick quarto-sized blank book with a red back and a marble c cover. From some, for some uh, <laughs> reason, the telescreen in the living room was in an unusual position. Instead of being replaced, as was normal in the end wall, where it could command the whole room, it was in the longer wall. Opposite the window, to one side of it, there was a shallow alcove in which Winston was now sitting, and which, when, <laughs> when the flats were built, had probably been intended to hold bookshelves. By sitting in the alcove and keeping well back, Winston was able to remain outside the range of the telescreen. <laughs> so far as sight went. Now, he could be heard, of course, but... So long as he stayed in his present position, he could not be seen. It was partly the unusual geography of the room that had suggested to him the thing that he was now about to do. <laughs> wow, this stuff sounds so familiar. I swear I read about this on the interwebs. Maybe I'm just imagining them that I've read some of this stuff on the interwebs. You know, like in chat rooms and such. <laughs> But, back to the epic tale, 1984. But it had also been suggested by the book that he had just taken out of the drawer. It was a particularly beautiful book. It's smooth, creamy paper. <laughs> a little yellowed by age. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> was of a kind that had not been manufactured for at least 40 years past. He could guess, however, that the book was much older than that. He had seen it lying in the window of a frowsy little junk shop in a slummy quarter of the town, just what quarter he did not now remember, and had been stricken immediately by an overwhelming desire to possess it. I must possess you. <laughs> I have that problem here and now. Not often. It's now and again, right? <laughs> Just asking my wife for permission to have an opinion. <laughs> right, honey? <laughs> anyway. Well, I actually was stoned for sip here. And meanwhile, <clears throat> this is a fun story to read, too. But it just... So familiar. Hmm. Why do? Why is all? Oh yeah, that's right. Because it seems like it's happening right now. Party members were supposed not to go 
into ordinary shops, dealing on the free market, it was called. But the rule was not strictly kept because there were various things, such as shoelaces and razor blades, which it was impossible to get a hold of in any other way. Oh, yeah, there's no black, the black market for shoelaces. Yeah, I could see that. Hey, you want to buy some shoelaces? <laughs> what are you going to do with them? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well. He had given a quick glance up and down the street, then had slipped inside, bought the book for $2.50. At the time, he was not conscious of wanting it for any particular purpose. He had carried it guiltily home in his briefcase. Even with nothing writ written in it, it was a compromising possession. Hmm. This guy writes some pretty weird weird words. The orders are interesting. Hmm. The thing that was about to, to do was to open a diary. This was not legal. Nothing was legal since there were no longer any laws. But if detected, it was reasonably certain that it would be punished by death, or at least by 25 years in a forced labor camp. Winston fit, fit a nib into the pen holder and sucked it to get the grease off. Strange hobby. The pen was an archaic instrument, seldom used even for signatures, and he had procured one, furtively and with some difficulty, simply because of the feeling that the beautiful, creamy paper deserved to be written on <laughs> with a real nib instead of being scratched with an ink pencil. Actually, he was not used to writing by hand. Apart from very short notes, it was usual to dictate everything into the speak right, which uh, was, of course, impossible for his present purpose. He dipped the pen into the ink and then faltered for just a second. A tremor had gone through his bowels. To mark the paper was the decisive act. In small, clumsy letters, he wrote, April 4th, 1984. He sat back. A sense of complete helplessness had <laughs> descended upon him. To begin with, he did not know with any certainty that this was 1984. It must be around about that date, since he was fairly sure that <laughs> his age was 39 and believed that he had been born in 1944 or 1945, but it was never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two. Wow, this is... <laughs> I don't remember the details of books that I've read or haven't read. Maybe I've never read all this. Mm. But, Considering the circumstances that we're all not facing at this particular time, boys is going well. Hmm, this book, I'm figuring out what he's talking about. Now, yeah, let's see what it's what. For whom? It suddenly occurred to him to wonder, was he writing this diary? For the future, for the unborn. His mind hovered for a moment around, uh, around the doubtful date on the page and then fetched up with a bump against the newspeak word double think. For the first time, the magnitude of what he had undertaken came home to him. How could you communicate with the future? It was of its nature impossible. Either the future would resemble the present, in which case it would not listen to him, or it would be different from it. <laughs> and his predicament would be meaningless. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. For some time, he sat gazing stupidly at the paper. Oh, I've done that. The telescreen had changed over to strident military music. It was curious that he seemed not merely to have lost the power of expressing himself. 
But even to have forgotten what it was that he had originally intended to say. For weeks past, he had been making ready for this moment. And it had never crossed his mind that anything would be needed except courage. The actual writing would be easy. All he had to do was to transfer to paper the interminable restless monologue that had been running inside his head, <laughs> literally for years. At this moment, however, even the monologue had dried up. Moreover, his varicose ulcer had been itching unbearably. He dared not scratch it, because if he did so, it would always become inflamed. Wow, he was smart, too. i see you later, sweetie. I, I'll be up after I'm done with my epic saga tonight. <laughs> okay. Uh, where was I? <clears throat> oh, moreover... Oh, no, no, no. He didn't became, the seconds were ticking by. He was conscious of nothing except the blankness of the page in front of him. The itching of the skin above his ankle, the blaring of the music, and a slight booziness caused by the gin. <laughs> Suddenly he began writing in sheer panic. Only imperfectly aware of what he was setting down, his small but childish handwriting straggled up and down the page, shedding first its capital letters and finally even its full stops. April 4th, 1984. Last night, to the flicks. All war films. One very good one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean. Audience much amused by shots of a great huge fat man trying to swim away with a helicopter after him. First you saw him wallowing along in the water like a porpoise. Then you saw him through the helicopter gun sights. Then he was full of holes and the sea around him turned pink. And he sank as suddenly as though the holes had let in the water. Audience shouting with laughter. Hmm. Sounds like a crowd. When he sank, then you saw a lifeboat boat pull, uh, pull, full of children with a helicopter hovering over it. Hmm. There was a middle-aged woman, might have been a Jewess, sitting up in the bow with a little boy about three years old in her arms. Little boy screaming with fright and hiding his head between her breasts, as if he was trying to burrow right into her. And the woman put her arms around him and comforted him, him, although she was blue with fright herself, all the time covering him up as much as possible, as if she thought her arms could keep the bullets off. Then the helicopter planted a 20-kilo bomb in among them, terrific flash, and the boat went all to matchwood. Then there was a wonderful shot of a child's arm going up, 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 right up into the air. A helicopter with a camera in its nose must have followed it up. And there was a lot of applause from the party seats. But a woman down in the, in the prowl part of the house suddenly started kicking up a fuss. And shouting, they didn't, they didn't, uh-oh, we got a typo here. They didn't utter of, shh, what are the kids they did? Well, I don't know how to define this one. Hmm, okay, we've run into a typo in the story, and I can't not figure out the word he's trying to use. So, not in front of the kids, they didn't, it ain't right, not in front of, the, not in front of kids, it ain't until... The police turned her out. Oh, I got typos going on. I don't suppose anything happened to her. Nobody cares what the proles say. Typical prole reaction. They, Winston, stopped writing. Ah, that's because the jibber, he's writing jibber-jabber. So that's why it wasn't making sense to me as I was trying to read it. So I fucked the story up. But, ah, well. <laughs> If you're if if you're taking the night off of uh, of the you know what and you're listening to this, well, it's kind of the same thing, I suppose. 
but I don't know. I don't. Uh, I didn't feel like reading any damn uh, links tonight. So I, I hope this is entertaining. I mean, I'm sure I'm butchering it a little bit. But, ah. <sighs> I didn't do too good in school either. Anyway, here I'll just start at the paragraph here. Winston stopped writing partly because he was suffering from cramp. <laughs> He did not know what had made him pour pour out his this stream of rubbish. There you go. But the curious thing was that while he was doing so, a totally different memory had clarified itself in his mind, to the point where he almost felt equal to writing it down. It was, he now realized, because of this other incident that he had suddenly decided to Come home and begin the diary today. So I pick a book, of course, that really you need to read it yourself. And uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't depend on on this as a, I don't know, anything more of a point of reference because I'm going to have fun with. It. I'm having fun reading it, but mm, I'm not here to teach anybody nothing. I was just. <laughs> Just slapped in the face, and how uh, what I do, you know, recall of this, how it fits what we're we're living in right now. You know, because the, the toaster can talk to you, and you can tell the ice cube machine how many ice cubes to make. You know, you can charge your phone and talk to somebody in Spain in your palm of your hand. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I just saw that. I will add this to the show notes. I was stalling for a little drink and a break from the reading. Ah, will do, Grimner. And uh, Grim had a request here. I want to follow through before I get too drunk and forget to do it. Because um, tonight's show is called, the title of the show was, <laughs> This is the Perfect Time for a Hoax. And that's what I think. I think uh, this is the perfect time in history. I think that people are they're confused enough about what is and what isn't with this internet thing to uh, be put exactly where they're going. And if you don't feel like you're being put somewhere, then it doesn't apply to you. Back to the epic tale of 1984. If I don't fuck it up any more than I already did. It had happened this morning at the ministry. If anything, so nebulous could be said to happen. It was nearly 1100. And in the records department, where Winston worked, they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the center of the hall opposite the big telescreen in preparation for the two minutes' hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows when two people whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to, came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying uh, a spanner, she had some mechanical job on one of the novel writing machines. She was a bold looking girl of about 27 with thick hair, a freckled old face and swift athletic movements. <laughs> yeah. A narrow scarlet sash emblem of the junior anti-sex league was found several times around the waist of her overalls. Mm-mm-mm just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes and general clean-mindedness, which she managed to carry about with her. He disliked her nearly all. He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones. 
It was always the women, and above all, the young ones, <laughs> who were the most bigoted adherents of the party. The swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies, and nosers out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than most. <laughs> so he married her. <laughs> oh, Mikey, I'm reading 1984. I'm just butchering it a little bit, though. I'm having a few shots and a little smoky pokey. But uh, this is a fun, it's a fun, fun time to read about this too, because of uh, you know the thing that's not happening in the world. <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, uh, once when they passed in the corridor, she gave him a quick, sidelong glance, which seemed to pierce right into him, and for a moment had filled him with black terror. <laughs> the idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the thought police. That it was true was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel <laughs> a peculiar uneasiness, which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility, <laughs> whenever she was anywhere near him. Wow. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. <laughs> yeah, like a bank manager or somebody that changes a toilet. <clears throat> or a carpenter. A momentary hush passed over the group of people around the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. Wow, these words. Or, wow, maybe he was half man, half, half beast. <laughs> brutal face. In spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. He had a trick of resettling his spectacles on his nose, which was curiously disarming, in some indefinable way, curiously civilized. It was a gesture which, if anyone had still thought in such terms, might have recalled an 18th century nobleman offering his snuff box. Oh, that artsy snurtsy, yeah, that shit. Hmm. Hold on a second. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast between O'Brien's urbane manner and his prize fighter's physique. Much more it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it irresistibly. Whoop. That's not a good thing, is it? <laughs> hey, anyway. Hmm. And again... Perhaps it was not even unorthodoxy that was written in his face, but simply intelligence. Hmm. But, at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get him alone. Hmm. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify this guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw it was nearly 1100, and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two-minute hate was over. 
He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman who worked in the next cubicle to Winston was between them. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. Ooh, it's getting kinky now, people. Okay, where am I? The next moment, a hideous, grinding speech, like the one I'm doing, as of some monstrous machine running without oil, burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. <laughs> the hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed on to the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider who once, long ago, how long ago, nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death, and had mysteriously <laughs> escaped and disappeared. <laughs> hey, Epstein! <laughs> Epstein's mother! No, anyway. The programs of the two minutes hate varied from day to day. But there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, heresies, deviations, sprang directly out of his teachings. Somewhere or other, he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies. Hey, Grim, they're writing a book about him. <laughs> oh. hmm. Perhaps somewhere beyond the sea, under the protection of his foreign paymasters. Perhaps even so, it was occasionally rumored in some hiding place in Oceania itself. Hmm. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. <laughs> he can never see the face of Goldstein without painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy arrow of white hair and a small goatee beard. A clever face and yet somehow inherently despicable with a kind of senile silliness in the long, thin nose, near the end of which a pair of spectacles were perched. It resembled the face of a sheep, and the voice, too, had a sheep-like quality. <laughs> Goldstein was, and the, was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party. An attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it, and yet just plausible enough to fill one with an alarmed feeling that other people, less level-headed than in oneself, might be taken in by it. Hmm. He was abusing Big Brother. He was denouncing the dictatorship of the party. He was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace uh, with Eurasia. He was advocating freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought. He was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed. And all this in rapid polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, hmm. and even contained newspeak words. More newspeak words, indeed. 
than any party member would normally use in real life. And all the while, lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen, there marched the endless columns of the Eurasian army. Row after row of solid-looking men with expressionless, hazyatic faces, who swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull rhythmic tramp of the soldiers' boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleeding voice. Ooh, that sounds like fun. I would party for that one. Before the hate had proceeded for 30 seconds, Uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. The self-satisfied sheep-like face on the screen and the terrifying power of the Eurasian army behind it were too much to be borne. Besides, the sight or even the thought of Goldstein produced fear and anger automatically. <laughs> He was an object of hatred more constant than either Eurasia or East Asia, since when Oceania was at war with one of these powers, it was generally at peace with the other. <laughs> but what was strange was that although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, although every day and a thousand times a day on platforms, on telescreen. In newspapers and books, his theories were refuted, smashed, ridiculed, held up to the general gaze for the pitiful rubbish they, that they were. Ah, oh, that sounds familiar. In spite of all this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always, there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his direction were not unmasked by the thought police. Hmm. He was the commander of a vast shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. Sounds terrible. Ooh, I'm scared. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be, there were also whispered stories of a terrible book, compendium of all the heresies of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely here and there. Hmm. Ah, had it. <clears throat> wow. Okay, where was I here? Now I lost my my place, baby. Hmm. Ah, oh, here we go. It was a book without a title. People referred to it, if at all, simply as the book. But one knew of such things only through vague rumors. Neither the Brotherhood nor the book was a subject that any ordinary party member would mention if there was a way of avoiding it. <laughs> In its... Oh boy, we're, we're working up to this. This is coming, folks. Hmm. <clears throat> In its second minute, the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the tops of their voices, in an effort to drown the maddening, bleeding voice that came from the screen. The little sandy-haired woman had turned bright pink, and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a landed fish. Even O'Brien's heavy face was flushed. <clears throat> he was sitting very straight in his chair, his powerful chest swelling and quivering as though he were standing up to the assault of a wave. The dark-haired girl behind Winston had begun crying. <laughs> crying out, sorry. Crying out. 
Swine, swine, swine. <laughs> and suddenly, she picked a heavy Newspeak dictionary and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment, Winston found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. The horrible thing about the two minute hate two minutes hate was not that one was obliged to act a part, but on the contrary, that it was impossible to avoid joining it. <laughs> within thirty within thirty seconds, any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness, <laughs> a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer, seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet the rage that was once felt, that one felt, was an abstract, undirected emotion which could be switched from one object to another, like the flame of a blow lamp. Hmm. Thus, at one moment, Winston's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, but, on the contrary, against Big Brother, the party, and the thought police. And at such time, moments... At, and at such moments, his heart went out to the lonely, derided her heretic on the screen, sole guardian of truth and sanity in a world of lies. And yet, the very next instant, he was at one with the people about him, and all that was said of Goldstein, seemed to him to be true. At those moments, his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration, and Big Brother seemed to tower up an invincible, fearless protector, standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia and Goldstein, in spite of his isolation, his helplessness, and the doubt that he hung about his very existence seemed like some sinister enchanter capable by the mere power of his voice of wrecking the structure of civilization. <laughs> this sounds like, wow, this sounds like uh, reading uh, memes and shit on the minds. You know, this is what's going on now. It's just written differently. I guess this is an older book. This, I wonder how old this book is. He wrote it, but he called it 1984, but I think he wrote it before that. Okay. <laughs> wow, it's just so... Uh, hmm. I don't know. What is the right way to put this? Appropriate. Because, you know, we're we're doing what we're doing. Whatever we are, you know, individually doing, we're doing it because we want to. <laughs> so, let's see. It was even possible at moments to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. Suddenly, by the sort of violent effort with which one wrenches one's head away from the pillow in a nightmare, Winston succeeded in transferring his hatred from the face on the screen to the dark-haired girl behind him. <laughs> Damn. Uh -huh. Vivid, beautiful hallucinations flashed through his mind. He, he would flog her to death with a rubber transient. He would tie her naked to a stake and shoot her full of arrows like St. Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Yeah, sounds fun. Better than before, moreover, he realized why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty and sexless, because he wanted to go to bed with her, and would never do so because round her sweet, supple waist, 
which seem to ask you to encircle it with your arm. <laughs> there was only the odious scarlet sash, aggressive symbol, chastity. <laughs> the hate rose to its climax. The voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat. And for an instant, the face, the figure of a Eurasian soldier, well, changed into that of a sheep. <laughs> I jumped the line. Then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing. Huge and terrible, his submachine gun roaring and seeming to spring out of the surface of the screen so that some of the people in the front row actually flinched backwards in their seat. But in the, mean mo in the same moment, Drawing a deep sigh of relief from everybody, the hostile figure melted into the face of Big Brother, black-haired, black-mustachioed, full of power and mysterious calm, and so vast that it almost filled up the screen. Nobody heard what Big Brother was saying. It was merely a few words of encouragement, the sort of words that are uttered in the din of battle, not distinguishable individually, but restoring confidence by the fact of being spoken. <laughs> then, <laughs> wow. then the face of Big Brother faded away again, and instead the three slogans of the party stood out in bold capitals. Where peace. Uh, see, they typoed. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. <laughs> but wow, what what a coincidence. Okay, that's about an hour. That's good enough for me, but uh I just felt like doing something different on a, in a perfect world tonight. We've we've been punishing each other all fucking week, you know, with this corona shit. And uh there's a lot of people that really believe this is true. So, hmm, I don't know. If it's true, there's nothing you can really do. You just think you can. And a lot of what we're being told about it is it's not. There's a lot of digging to do to get to the truth. Let's just say that. And I put the uh, the 1984 in the notes, Grimner, so, uh, and, and the picture, too, the thing you posted. So there we go. And then what do we got? We got uh, go to the reallibertymedia.com. And open up the site. They've got a page for every adventure that Grimm offers. And you got radio, and you got there's other people that do radio programs uh, besides me. So, you know, there's Grimm and Moose Girl. There, well, Miss Mary sometimes comes, or Rob works. And we got Larry Woods is doing a new show with Rob Works together on Thursday. I host that, but nah, I'm just wanted to be involved, but I don't really. I don't really spend a lot of time pontificating over there. So anyway, thanks for hanging out with me tonight. On, uh, <laughs> I just felt goofy and like reading something, and I popped up with 1984 by George Orwell for your reading perusal, and listening perusal too, I suppose. I didn't post it, but everybody knew what it was. So we're going to, I guess, what else is there left to do? Just thanks to the folk that... Uh, took the night off with me, you know, a little time off from the, the the mundane, boring drivel, and I got to read some other mundane, boring drivel, but I, I should have uh, got a better source, because I had a few typos, and I got confused. <laughs> I didn't really um, expect what I was reading to be written the way it was written, so it was throwing me off here and there. And I think that, I'm going to reopen up my close button here. And uh, outside of, I guess, what would I say? Mm. Take a good look around you. And if you're not comfortable, I still think it's you that's not comfortable. Good night, everybody.